Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar hosted by CalcBench to explore issues in financial reporting and financial statement analysis. I'm your host, Matt Kelly, moderator today. We're delighted that you could join us. Today's webinar will run about 40 minutes and will be divided into two sections. First, I'll interview our guest for today. That is Jason Voss. He is a longtime investment strategist and financial analyst. Jason is going to address several points that analysts should consider when they are looking at financial statements. Then we'll have a second half where CalcBench walks us through some of those same examples again, demonstrating how you can use CalcBench data analysis tools to find information about corporate filers that might better help you understand what they're reporting. Uh, one housekeeping detail before we begin, this webinar is recorded, so we are not taking live questions from listeners. But if you do have questions, we're eager to hear them. Feel free to email us at info at calcbench.com, and one of the team here will reply to you within 24 hours. So as I mentioned earlier, our first guest today is Jason Voss. He is an award-winning thought leader and strategist, speaker, author, and investment manager. These days, Jason is the CEO of Active Investment Management Consulting. He previously was content director for the CFA Institute, and prior to that, he was portfolio manager at the Davis Appreciation and Income Fund. He's also co-founder of the Sarasota Institute. That is a think tank that explores various public policy and economic issues. And Jason has written several books on investment analysis. And yes, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, in his spare time, Jason is a student of ninjutsu, which is the martial art of being a ninja. So with all that said, and without any other delay, uh, Jason, welcome. Thanks very much. It's nice to be here, Matt. So here's what we were planning to do here today. As everybody can see on your screen, we're going to focus on three points of financial an analysis that Jason has written about previously. That is, analysis practices that not enough people do or do well. They are not connecting numbers to narratives, uh, failing to consider comparisons across time, and ignoring the footnotes. So Jason, for each of these points, I'm going to read off something that you have written previously about that point and then ask you to elaborate a bit more and maybe walk us through some examples. Um, how does all that sound? Perfect, it's my pleasure. All right, so then let's go with uh, point number one, not connecting numbers to narratives. Uh, and your point that investors need to think that through as companies report all of these things to investors. This below quote is from a post you wrote last year, and I'll just read it out. Ideally, unmodified financial statements are examined and the amounts reported in these statements are matched to specific narratives of the business as revealed in the management discussion and analysis section. So first, just Tell us a bit more here about what you mean and why this is so important. Sure. Um, I think the first point to uh, put out there is that financial statement uh, numbers are evidence after the fact of management's behavior. And that behavior is frequently in accord with a strategy and some sort of long term view of the industries in which they operate. So one of the tricks that I used to utilize when I was uh, portfolio manager of the Davis Appreciation and Income Fund was to begin my analysis uh, with the reading of the management uh, discussion analysis section, uh, alias the MDNA, you'll sometimes hear it referred to as, mm -hmm. and begin to sort of get in tune with how management saw their business. And these narratives before the fact are just that. They're, they're sort of the mythology or fiction or stories that they're telling themselves, that they're telling the employees at the firms uh, that they manage, and that they're telling investors are going to happen. And then afterward, the expectation is that you then uh, do the financial statement analysis and try and match up um, those numbers relative to the narrative. So said another way, uh, if, if management puts down a bet, A, the financial statements after the fact, B, are the verification that those narratives are authentic and wor worth paying attention to. And it's been my experience that um, analysts oftentimes don't connect the numbers to the narratives ahead of time like that. Um, instead, they dive straight into the numbers and the narratives are sort of left behind. Okay, so give us an example of what you mean there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say ahead of time for each of the three uh, major points today on the webinar, I'm using uh, companies that are still around, but going back in time uh, to a time 
uh, in some cases two decades ago um, to essentially protect the company. So this is not an indictment of the companies currently. This is an indictment or a reveal about companies as they existed in some cases, you know, 15, 20 years ago to, to protect the innocent, as they say. All um, right. so, so for this bullet point, uh, Xerox is my example. And back in the day, uh, the narrative about Xerox from Wall Street and from the investment community was that they were having their uh, they were being handed uh, a bad deal by the dot com companies. And essentially Xerox was no longer seen as a technology company that was competitive, but that was failing and going to be rapidly failing in the face of uh, everything that was happening in the dot com era. And so Xerox, of course, was very sensitive to this, and not surprisingly, their shares were not very competitive. I think their PE dropped massively, and uh, Xerox came out with this uh, new strategy, quote-unquote strategy, um, that they're going to put in place to drive revenues, and they waxed philosophic about it in their MDNA, and they said that they were going to be delivering top line revenue growth of 10% for um, the next uh, five years. And yet, if you were to check their numbers against that narrative after the fact, you would have discovered several things. First of all, um, they weren't changing their product portfolio, which is a part of the narrative, but there's also uh, verification of that in their 10Ks. Um, you didn't see any new products being launched. Any technological advancements that they were making were incremental, like new features essentially on the same copy machines, fax machines that they were selling at the time. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing earth shaking um, in terms of what was happening. They're also going to be using the same distribution network for their sales. The sales force was incentivized in exactly the same way. And so there wasn't a lot of evidence in the narrative that they're going to be able to deliver this. Then if you actually check the numbers, you would see that in the preceding three years, uh, up until the moment that they sort of launched their new narrative around sales, the very best that they had been able to deliver was in 1998, which is what you see on your screen. And that had been 9.6%. And that had been the very best sales performance Xerox had delivered in approximately two decades. And every single thing had gone right for them that year. And so they were essentially saying they're going to exceed that for the next five years, having changed nothing. And so the next bit of narrative and the next bit of wisdom to couple with the, the numbers here is uh, their competition was not going to sit still, right? So if somebody prints 9.6, percent top line revenue growth on a multi-billion dollar company, the competition will respond. And so it was highly unlikely they're going to be able to deliver 10%. So in summary, Xerox was claiming 10% uh, top line revenue growth for the next five years in 1998, and it just didn't match the economic reality as described in the, the numbers, as well as um, the discussion in the MDNA. So now when you describe it all like this, and of course we have the benefit of hindsight today, but when you describe it all like this, it's an eminently sensible thing that you're saying here. So I'm just curious, um, is this hard for financial analysts to do in your opinion, or do they simply not do it enough or well enough or, or what's going on? Well, some do. Um, and yes, any prospective decision is always difficult. And I, I didn't just highlight this because it was something that I had successfully uh, assessed. It's just the case that the, the special technique I'm advocating for here is to start with the MDNA and to look at the narratives ahead of time. So in 1998, when I was a lowly research analyst at the Davis Funds, not even a portfolio management at the time, I started with the MDNA, listened to what management was saying about the business and then and only then did I go back and look at the numbers to see if they had delivered on their promises. And if you just start with the numbers and it doesn't exist in the narrative, you can rationalize as an analyst. You can also listen to management's uh, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking of their lack of results. So say, for example, you started looking at Xerox in 1998 and you looked at 1998's numbers right away. Management is already providing an explanation for why they may have failed at delivering uh, what they've been talking about two years prior. So it's, I think, more important to reverse the order of that. Start with their claims, the fictions, the myths, the stories that they're weaving about their company and its prospective performance, and then check after the fact the numerical st uh, story. And what you would see with Xerox is that their MDNA was 
sensitive to the fact that they weren't seen as competitive with the dot-com companies and that they had a big grand strategy that they were launching. And then when you actually check the numbers, you didn't see evidence that they'd been able to deliver that. So I'm really essentially ordering for, uh, arguing rather for, for making sure you get your ordering correct in terms of your analysis. Okay. So now we will move on to your next point, uh, looking or failing to look at comparisons across time. Uh, and we have this statement on the screen now that you had written. The temporal dimension for the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement are all different. Consequently, analysts must put all of the financial statements on the same temporal dimension. Same question as before. Tell us more about what you mean here and why this is so important. Yeah, it's important because uh, you want to compare apples to apples, right? So because the income statement, for example, in the second quarter that's reported in a 10Q in the United States shows the aggregate uh, uh, income statement rather than the quarterly income statement, if you make a comparison to um, the balance sheet, it's going to be slightly off. Um, if you're going to make a comparison to the cash flow statement, you also have the aggregated cash flow statement up to the second quarter, uh, but you're not getting a quarterly comparison. And it, it's been my experience that companies will hide uh, fluctuations in their business to take advantage of the fact that they've got uh, in the second and third quarter in particular, uh, an aggregate income statement, an aggregate cash flow statement. Um, and so essentially it's just saying, look, if you're making a comparison for the second quarter, you want all second quarter numbers. And if you're looking at the third quarter, you want all third quarter numbers and likewise the fourth quarter. Now, importantly, the fourth quarter and first quarter all are reported on the same basis. Um, the annual uh, numbers, for example, are all reported annually, but still if you want the fourth quarter number, you're going to have to solve for that. So just really quickly, the way you do that, is you take the annual numbers as reported in the 10K and you subtract out, uh, say, so for example, if you want the fourth quarter number, the performance of the first three quarters of a given year to isolate the fourth quarter numbers. And then you can make your comparison against the balance sheet, uh, which is always a snapshot as of the end of a period of time. Mm -hmm. And you have to do the same with the cash flow statement. So essentially it asks of the analyst that they do a little bit more work than most in my experience are prepared to do. And when you do that, you begin to see some of the, the games that companies play. You also can begin to see sort of the vagaries of seasonality in the business more clearly. You can also begin to see uh, any sorts of, um, especially subtleties of the business like networking capital investments sometimes can be very high in some quarters and lower in others. And you can begin to isolate some of those effects. So essentially I'm just arguing uh, top, the, the, the philosophically high level uh, apples to apples. Okay, so now the example that we wanted to walk through here, speaking of games that companies might play or timing, uh, we had this example of yours from Crown Castle Incorporated. Uh, walk us through it here. Yeah, so Crown Castle, and again, uh, this is going to tie into the first point about matching narratives to numbers. The narrative of Crown Castle uh, circa 2001 was that they were a part of uh, the cell phone tower uh, owners globally. And the investment community and the cell side community in particular were hyping up which of the first, uh, which of the companies at the time were going to be first to print uh, positive operating cash flow, positive free cash flow for a given period. And up until that time, everybody had sort of been uh, negative cash flow businesses. And the two front runners were American Tower, ticker AMT, and Crown Castle CCI. And so in the uh, that's that's bullet point one. Bullet point two uh, is that a part of the narrative was that you had to understand the tower business. And the tower business essentially is a fixed cost investment of the tower. And then you add antennas uh, onto the towers in order to increase the rental revenue or the lease revenue that the companies like Crown Castle, American Tower collect. And above 1.8 approximately antennas, a tower was cash flow positive. And so it ought to be a very stable business because the carriers, the cell phone companies themselves, 
uh, they have to have these antennas in place so they don't have drop calls for their customers. So it ought to suggest that a company like Crown Castle, once it became cash flow positive, ought to have very stable cash flows at the operating level because they're just writing more leases. They're adding more antennas onto these towers and you don't expect or anticipate that they'll be subtracted from the tower. So now drop yourself into uh, time period 2001 and they printed a second quarter operating cash flow number uh, whose operating cash flow was barely above what it had been in the first quarter. But here's the thing. Uh, Crown Castle was widely celebrated first quarter of 2001 as having been the first of the tower companies to print positive operating cash flows and they experienced a subsequent bid up in their shares. In the second quarter, though, you would expect approximately a doubling, if not a slight increase, of first quarter operating cash flows, because again, the number of antennae on their towers should have stayed stable or gone up. But instead, what you saw was barely a tick up. And I only saw that because I had broken out the first quarter operating cash flow number apart from the second quarter. Uh, 10Q reported numbers. And by subtracting first quarter from the aggregated numbers reported in that second quarter uh, 10Q, I could see the operating cash had just barely gone up. And that just did not jive with the narrative understanding that I had for the business. And it made no sense. And I, I looked at the balance sheet to try and see if I could explain what had happened. I tried to analyze the net income state or the income statement and I couldn't figure it out. So I called the company to figure out what was going wrong uh, or what was happening there. And I received a call back eh, approximately two weeks later that featured the controller for the company, the CFO, as well as the corporate counsel. <laughs> and what they confessed to me, uh, and back in the day, I actually we recorded uh, using recording equipment all of our interactions with management as well as conference calls on the tape. This is how, how long ago this was. Um, I recorded the conversation and what they confessed to me was, and rather sheepishly, that they had executed a sales lease back with the BBC to acquire uh, the BBC's collection of towers in the UK. And what they had negotiated with the BBC was delaying the payment on the lease back portion of the portfolio uh, by one day. So it was due March the 31st of 2001 and they had negotiated for a little bit of extra uh, interest as well as probably some sort of consideration the BBC with the BBC to pay on April the 1st. So thus they printed a very high positive cash flow number quarter one, quarter two barely a tick up because they actually owed that lease payment. And so that's why uh, you saw that, that effect. But nonetheless, if you were to just look at the second quarter aggregated cash flow from operations, you would see positive uh, operating cash flow. So they still reported positive, but if you subtracted 1Q from 2Q, you saw that um, it had dropped significantly in the second quarter and it only made sense once you got the actual what had happened from the company. Said so another way, the company had engaged in, eh, I don't know if you'd call it fraud, there was no disclosure about it in their statements. I would say it's borderline fraudulent what they did mm -hmm. um, and subsequently we sold the shares. All right. And now your last point about reading the footnotes. Uh, here is the, the money quote. Most analysts do not read them, nor do most analysts take the numbers from the footnotes and put them into the main three financial statements. First, let me say that everyone here at CalcBench loves reading the footnotes. So we're with you on this. Uh, why, in your estimation, do people not take enough time for this footnote exercise? Well, that, that's a very long answer um, if we went and wanted to excavate it fully. But I, I think there are two main reasons. One, I think oftentimes on the buy side, it's a dirty, dark secret that uh, many folks on the buy side don't do their own research. Mm -hmm. uh, so said another way, they're reliant upon the sell side and what the sell side reports. Going back just half a step to the Crown Castle uh, example, in the Crown Castle example, nobody on Wall Street noticed what I noticed. I kept waiting for... Uh, Lehman Brothers, which was the investment bank of those tower companies to report, and they never really did report about the, the fraudulent activity. I don't think their analysts ever noticed it. I didn't see any other evidence of it. I talked to others on the buy side about it. Nobody mentioned it. So that meant that nobody was doing what I was doing, and I seem to have been the only person who noticed uh, what Crown Castle had done. So that's the first reason why I think people don't look at the footnotes is they just don't do their own research and they're, they're reliant upon the sell side to a large degree. Second, they're uh, reliant on 
uh, data aggregators like Bloomberg, Backset, so on, not CalcBench. CalcBench, uh, one of the reasons I, I love CalcBench is you guys provide the ability to, to do some of the things that I'm describing. Um, and so, for example, putting things on the same temporal basis, that's something that CalcBench can do. Uh, the footnote information can be added to the financial statements. Um, so unless you're using the right data aggregator, it's just not possible. Um, and I always hand entered my data. I, I was a throwback in that way. And I entered it directly from the 10Ks, Qs, proxy statements, et cetera. So that's why I was able to have the flexibility to do some of these things. And if the aggregator doesn't let you do it, then most don't. Um, and then the third reason I think uh, many buy side folks don't do it is they're just t under time pressures. Um, the big firms like uh, Fidelity, for example, uh, Franklin Templeton, they can afford to have a team of analysts do this kind of work. But if you're an average sized uh, active investment manager, say a firm size of 15 to 20, you may not have the time necessarily to indulge this. And you're really checking in with the Q's and K's to make sure that there are any train wreck type situations. And you know, don't necessarily go back and, and analyze the footnotes. So those are my top three reasons why I think most people don't look at the footnotes, All right. even though they should. And then an example of how to put the footnotes to good use. We have this from uh, Skechers, the sneaker people. Um, what was going on there? Yeah, so again, this goes back uh, to circa 1999-2000 uh, with Skechers. And Skechers, again, narratives to numbers, the context of Skechers at the time was that they were a superior manager of the, the shoe wear business because uh, they, they were asset light. And that matched a narrative that was quite popular in the late 90s and early aughts, which was favor businesses as an investor that have solved the uh, high fixed costs of property, plant equipment and other assets problem. And so I was somewhat dubious. I didn't understand how Skechers was able to do asset light, given that they manufacture shoes. Um, that, that seems like a business uh, for which you need to do that. So I went into my understanding of Skechers a little bit dubious. And by the way, as a customer of Skechers, right? So mm -hmm. I actually enjoyed their sneakers and I had sort of Doc Martin knockoffs that I used to wear that I really thought were comfortable from Skechers. So I was a fan of them as a customer, but I was dubious of the claim that they had somehow solved the asset like problem. I didn't know how that was possible. And what Skechers was taking advantage of was the sort of uh, gap that's generally accepted accounting principles uh, criteria for which you use operating and capital leases. And that's left to the discretion of management. There's not necessarily a legal definition of that. And so if you are uh, using leases to do something substantial and significant for your business that is considered essential for the business, you're supposed to report those as capital leases. Those capital leases are therefore considered a part of your capital structure and reported on the balance sheet, um, typically as a part of your long-term debt. Some companies actually break it out into a separate number. But Skechers had made the determination at the management level that the manufacturing of their shoes would be handled as operating leases. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't match the narrative. The narrative is they're a shoe company and that's what they do. They sell shoes. Sure. So the it doesn't make any sense that they would offload uh, all of the capital involved in manufacturing their shoes into operating leases, which then are off balance sheet and only reported in their footnotes. And they disclose that in their footnotes. Ergo, they've met the legal requirement of actually disclosing this. Uh, their justification for it wasn't really given. It just said that uh, in explaining their operating leases, it, it, it just very dryly said, you know, Skechers has a significant portion of the manufacturing of its shoes uh, reported and handled by operating leases. And here are the operating lease disclosures. So what it requires the analyst to do is, A, notice the narratives relative to the numbers, but then you actually have to capitalize uh, the operating leases as a form of capital. And you can do that, uh, CalcBench does it for you, but the, the technique for doing that is to look at the payments owed on operating leases um, and you can use a debt rate that uh, for a comparable company, say in the case for sake of argument, Skechers is a triple B credit, you can take the uh, current yield on a triple B piece of paper and divide that into the average operating lease payment to scale up and capitalize the operating lease payment to get approximately how much capital they have offloaded to footnotes. 
then what you do is you recalculate all the financial ratios like long-term debt ratio, for example, to, to look at the capital structure, as well as things like return on invested capital to sort of see how they do relative to the competition. And what I discovered is that when you do that, Skechers actually had worse performance, not better, relative to the competition, which was completely contrary to the narrative being reported by the sell side uh, about Skechers. All right. Well, Jason, that is the third of the three we wanted to cover, and that's all the time we have in this section of the podcast today. But uh, you gave us plenty to think about, and so thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Now we're going to shift gears to our next segment to discuss how you can use CalcBench data analysis tools to explore the very issues Jason has been talking about. Our guest for this segment is Pranav Guy. He is co-founder and chief executive officer of CalcBench. Pranav manages the day-to-day operations of the firm, and he has more than 20 years' experience in financial analysis. Pranav previously had worked at TIAA and ITG, and he was vice president at Morgan Stanley, where he was in charge of modelware and quantitative and derivative strategies there. Aside from CalcBench, Pranav also serves as a board member of XBRL US, and he is on the Technical Computing Advisory Board for Microsoft, And he's a member of the CFA Institute's Corporate Disclosure Policy Council, which looks at issues affecting the quality of financial reporting and disclosure worldwide. So, Pranav, welcome. Thank you. Hey, Matt. How's everything? Pretty good. Before we get into specific thoughts about what Jason Voss had discussed, just give me the elevator pitch about why CalcBench is so useful for financial analysts and some of the features and capabilities you think they should know about. Um, what, What do you have for us here? Sure. So we started CalcBench, uh, Alex and I, seven, eight years ago with the idea that there had to be a better way to research companies, get data for researching companies than than methods that existed. And um, alongside all of the experience that we had doing this in our previous work, was this new tool uh, that the SEC mandated called uh, XBRL, Extensible Business Reporting Language. That's an acronym that rolls off the tongue for a lot of us to know. Um, it's XBRL is a machine-readable data source. So what it allows uh, computers to do is to ingest data from the financial statements in this readable form for them and grab it um, and we can put it into databases and then uh, bring the interfaces for people to look at these things and uh, make decisions very, very quickly. And CalcBench lets people go from, uh, you know, the face statements, the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow as the company actually filed it uh, and not with an intermediary in the way even though we are an intermediary, we don't actually get in the way of that process. So you actually see the data the way the company filed it and intended for you to see it. In addition to that, CalcBench gives you the ability to go deep into the footnotes and explore the hidden corners of all of these financial statements and render that information back. And in so doing all of these things, you become just really, it's a very facile, uh, an easy way to get to the hard stuff in the financial statements. And it's amazing what you can find in there. It's these companies, they, they tell you everything. So you have some of the key features here up on the screen, like uh, what do you think is most cool or you're most proud of there? You know, what should people know about? Uh, well, you know, each one of these things is unique. Um, And they kind of uh, feed off one another. So picking one is really hard. If I had to pick one, I'd probably pick the disclosure queries because that's where all of the the hidden stuff is, but no longer because you can search so quickly. So uh, you've always heard, uh, you know, analysts talk about, well, the juicy nuggets of the of the details the company uh, puts out are all in the footnotes. And so the disclosure queries are a fast way of getting to that information very, very uh, succinctly and cleanly. And you can do that across uh, across peers. So that sort of leads to the other stuff. And you can 
you know you can you can ask very very detailed questions of the data and get answers back uh, in relative short order so I'd say the combination of the disclosure and the peer comparison is really really uh, where CalcVenge distinguishes itself and we've we've been able to use a lot of those techniques uh, the computer the computerization techniques that we apply with and uh, to disclosures and peer comparisons into our analysis of earnings releases uh, alongside you know the, the company in detail stuff that we've been doing uh, you know pretty much since day one so let's pivot back to Jason Voss and his three points about financial analysis the first one that he raised was about connecting numbers and narratives and here the example we wanted to use was Kraft Heinz um, I'll do the backstory and then Pranav I'll let you walk through the analysis as most people listening probably know, Kraft Heinz today is the result of a giant merger that closed in 2015 between H.J. Heinz Company and Kraft Foods. So at the end of 2017, goodwill for that entire conglomerate was $44.8 billion worldwide. The value of the intangible assets was $59.45 billion. And here we have our picture of some of those assets, uh, the intangibles up on your screen. Kraft and Heinz and Oscar Mayer and a few other brand labels. Uh, so that's what we had. And then suddenly, blammo, earlier in February, we had this gigantic goodwill impairment of, um, or I should say an overall impairment of $15.4 billion. And that was split between a goodwill write-down and an intangible assets write-down, which you do not see too often. And the company had specifically cited, as you can see, slowdowns in the U.S. and Canada businesses for the write-down of goodwill, and then also writing down the intangibles because of the Kraft and Oscar Mayer trademarks, because apparently we are all eating healthier foods and we don't like processed foods. Um, my question was, okay, so this write-down dropped on everybody's lap in February of 2019. Is there some way somebody looking at those operating segments before the trouble signs, uh, before the impairment happened, could they have seen the trouble signs and perhaps anticipated that this goodwill issue, this write-down issue might be forthcoming? So Pranav, walk us through the rest of the story here. Take it away. So we talked earlier about the power of the footnotes mm -hmm. that are available to, to users and CalcBench specifically uh, does, we, we take the user through the, the footnote experience by allowing them to, you know, simply, you can just read a footnote directly by isolating that particular section of the document and simply read, or you can actually lift data directly out of that footnote and put it into a tabular format or an Excel or whatever you want so that you can just analyze the data. And the segment, the operating and geographic segment footnote is particularly useful for this exercise. And what you see in front of you here is the Kraft Heinz geographic data from the 2015-2016 uh, and 2017 10Ks with the revenue segment or the revenue piece for the geographic segments of the United States and Canada. So you kind of piece that together and you say, okay, look, Kraft Heinz generated 12 to $20 billion range in the last several years with respect to these two geographies. And so you may ask yourself, well, you know, what is it that we can tell from this? Well, you, you, you now know given what you see in front of you, the levels of sales generated from those two geographies. But you also can look up the history of both Kraft and Heinz very, very quickly, piece it together, and then come back and say, look, this is what the combined company would have done had it been combined. And, you know, obviously it's a conjecture, but had it been combined back in 2012. And that's what you see on this slide here. And that is that the United States revenue and the Canadian revenue for Kraft North America, which is at the top, was in the range of 17 to 18 billion in 2014, um, actually in, in that period. So 17 to 18 billion, let's just call it 18 billion for, you know, for round number six. Obviously, you could you could add it yourself. And the lower table is the Heinz data. And so you see North America there from 2014 at 4.25.
So you say, okay, well, that's about 22, 22 and a half, maybe somewhere in that range, $22 billion. And now remember what we said before on the previous slide, we're talking about 20 and a half billion, which is our third bullet point right here. So you're talking about a reduction in sales of about a billion and a half dollars from 2014 to 2017. Now you, we've pieced that together. Uh, we did that exercise in preparation for this webinar. It took us literally, what, two minutes to mm -hmm. do it? Yep. Yeah. So it took longer for me to explain it in this webinar than it did to actually pull up that data. I think that's fair. And that's the power of XBRL, CalcBench, and footnotes working for you. I just I think it's interesting. It backs up Jason's broad thesis that if you listen to what the managers are saying, we're going to merge, everything's going to be great, there'll be synergies all over the place. And then if you actually look at the numbers, well, hold up, guys. You know, your North America sales, which is the biggest market in the whole world, have gone down by, what, 10% or so in the last three years. And then what did we think was going to happen? Um, you know, you wind up with some sort of impairment because something's got to give. And so here we are. Right. And even if the sales were flat, you'd expect, you know, you'd ex the, the quote unquote synergies to unlock. You would you'd hope that you'd get higher sales out of something. Um, but that's just not happening. So <laughs> the result is what we see or what we saw last week. And for everybody listening, we should note at the time we are recording this uh, masterclass webinar, Kraft has not yet filed its 2018 annual numbers. Uh, they did file after their impairment announcement. They filed another not timely warning that they're going to be late. We don't know when we will see those numbers. We don't know what they'll look like. But meanwhile, here we are. Now, let's move on to Jason's second point about uh, looking at comparisons across time. And uh, he talked a lot about operating cash flow from one quarter to the next and not just cumulative, but what was the actual cash flow in a specific period. So we just pulled up this example here of operating cash flow period by period for 2018 from some of the Dow Jones industrials. Uh, walk us through what we're looking at here and where it comes from. Oh, so this is a um, this is something that we as analysts, um, both Alex and I, and especially Alex, struggled with um, when we were doing this kind of work. Um, and Jason mentioned it; he struggled with the same thing. And it's, you know, when you have a um, when you have a cash flow statement, the cash flow statement measures a cumulative period in time. So at the end of quarter one, you've got your data for a particular quarter. At the end of the second reporting period quarter two, whether that's fiscal or calendar, what have you, you've got six months of data in there. So if you wanted to say, for example, what are the cash flow from operations for the for the second quarter, you actually would have to go to the second quarter cash flow from operations, pull that up, pull up a first quarter cash flow from operations number, and then subtract the two yourself. And if you wanted to do it for the third quarter, you'd have to do the same thing for the quarter three statement along with the quarter two statement. What we do at CalcBench is we actually let you with one, you know, you can actually pick the operating cash flows and metric on our multi-company page, and then actually just put, uh, a little button for quarterly, you just, you know, push that little button and, uh, all of a sudden, you've got all of that stuff right in front of you. So what you see there, that 2258 number for 3M is actually their cash flow from operations for the fourth quarter of 2018. Mm -hmm. That number is not actually reported anywhere. So you would have to get the full year operating cash flow, get the, the operating cash flow cumulative through the end of the third quarter, which is actually not on the screen you see in front of you. Yep. Subtract the two, and then you get up with you get your two two five eight number. And so what you can see is the operating cash flow for American Express in the fourth quarter of 2018 is actually negative. So they report a quite high operating cash flow for the full year, 8.93 billion dollars. But in the fourth quarter, it looks like uh, uh, something went amiss. So, you know, you can dig into that. I'm sure there's a good reason for it, mm -hmm. but uh, you can dig into that yourself and start asking a second level question very, very quickly. Okay. And then uh, Jason's third point about the footnotes. I know that footnotes are near and dear to all of us at CalcBench. Uh, so we pulled out these two footnotes from Chipotle about 
leasing costs. And I know that there is a new leasing standard that went into effect on January 1st of this year where you were going to have to start listing your operating lease costs on the balance sheet as of when you adopt it. And you had to adopt it starting in 2019, but not necessarily on December 31st of 2018. So we have these footnotes here. Walk us through what we're reading now. So um, you're absolutely right. CalcBench loves the footnotes. It is near, these these um, pieces of the financial statement are near and dear to our hearts. Uh, the goodwill and intangibles that you mentioned before are all captured in the footnotes. Um, the leases is something we've actually written about um, and we've all spoken about for uh, for a while now. So if someone's interested in getting details on our leases, you can go to the uh, CalcBench research page and download our, our lease report that we did last summer that shows you um, what we expected or what we expect will go onto the balance sheet uh, from uh, operating leases uh, for companies in uh, in 2019 and, and towards the end of 2018. Chipotle is a particularly interesting case because their, um, their reported total liabilities on their 2017 balance sheet was somewhere in the 700 or 800 million dollar neighborhood. And if you read the footnotes, you would see that their uh, lease payments, as you see directly in front of you, are uh, about almost $4 billion. So that's that dwarfs the number of uh, reported on the balance sheet for liabilities. Mm -hmm. So as we understood it, what they were going to have to do was to take those, those lease payments, discount them, uh, and then take the right to use uh, asset number uh, discounted and put it directly on the balance sheet as an asset and then offset that asset with a uh, with a liability of roughly the same amount and uh, therefore what was going to happen is their their um, Chipotle's assets would go up by some discounted number uh, that was quite significant uh, well over two billion dollars maybe between two and three billion dollars and they would have a liability that was about the same and so their shareholders' equity or book value wasn't going to move much, but the individual assets and liabilities were go, are going to you know be impacted because of this lease disclosure. And what we found when we went to go look at the Chipotle uh, you know year-end 2018 balance sheet was that uh, the actual total liabilities didn't change very much. Kind of scratched our heads. Said, "Hey, what's going on?" And then your figure two comes directly into play there. And I'm happy to have you read it and tell me what you see there. Well, what I see is that uh, they expect to record all of these costs and um, the changes in rights of use assets and whatnot. But uh, the last part, the, the last few words there that are highlighted in blue are the key. As of January 1st, 2019. Um, now, yes, they say that we don't expect a material impact on our consolidated statement of income or of cash flows. That's true. But I, to my reading of it, you know, guys, you're omitting the fact that within 24 hours between January, between December 31st and January 1st, you are going to have a radical change to how your balance sheet looks. And just kind of whistling that in in the footnotes and hoping that nobody notices until, I don't know, the next 10Q or 10K gets filed when you look at it again. Um, and it'll look very different, but it'll only look very different because they quietly disclosed within one minute, we're gonna flip a switch and suddenly these off, liability, these off balance sheet liabilities and assets pile onto the, the balance sheet all at once. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's basically that that's basically what happens. I mean, you know, the um, the balance sheet's going to grow a lot uh, in the next reporting period, and they they knew this. I mean, this was something that uh, they're they they are probably one of the largest um, uh, leasers out there with respect to you know their 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 assets prior to it. And I mean, it's they're no different than you know other other large uh, you know retailing outlets that you know rely a lot on foot traffic, et cetera, to get their business. They just simply have a lot of storefronts, and uh, 
there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the accounting standard is going to hit these companies disproportionately. So it's not just Chipotle. There are other companies. Potbelly is going to be hit very, very hard with this. Um, and there are others as well. So, uh, however, the reason this one came up is because relative to their existing balance sheet, these these lease liabilities are, are quite large. Whereas, you know, you might have a company like AT&T that has a lot of leases, but their balance sheet is so big uh, that, uh, you know, they can absorb um, they can absorb a large leasing liability um, and not um, uh, while their numbers will change, uh, they won't change as dramatically as someone like as a firm like Chipotle. All right. Uh, so, Pranav, that's all the time we have for this webinar, but you covered a lot of ground for us. So uh, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. All right, Matt. Again, everyone, that was Pranav Guy, co-founder and CEO of CalcBench, walking us through some of the ways that CalcBench can help you with your financial analysis needs. We were also joined earlier in the program by Jason Voss, an investment analyst and strategist out there. And he was giving his views on three practices that investors might use to sharpen their financial statement analysis. If you have any further questions, Pranav and the rest of the gang at CalcBench would be happy to hear from you. So drop them a line at us at calcbench.com. That's all for this webinar. I've been your host, Matt Kelly, editor of Radical Compliance. Thank you for listening and have a good day.